Show me how you offer to your people and the world the stories and the songs you want our children's children to remember. And I will show you how I struggle, not to change the world, but to love it. That was by Oriana Mountain Dreamer. And you are now watching the Inspired Word Cafe. We have a really great flash fiction writer about to present to you some of his work. His name's Tristan Carter. So let's give a warm welcome um, to Tristan for coming out tonight. Hello. I am going to read some flash fiction for you guys. Quite a few of them. So let's go. Um, this one's called Argot. Carly walked into the coffee shop all, hey, I love this song, and went to the counter and was very, wow, so nice that there's no lineup. Cute barista guy with his beard joked all like, you're my fave customer, and drew a heart in her macchiato like this is casual for me. Carly walked out like, I'd be fine with him asking me out, but I'm not like dying for it, you know? Outside, a man walking his wiener dog, missing its two hind legs replaced by wagon wheels, tipped his cool it man trucker hat and winked at Carly and she smiled very what a cute man what an inspiring dog I bet he's going to pick up a muffin for his wife Carly sipped her coffee so perfect he walked in and shrugged like there's that hipster barista Jonathan stared at the barista's beard like how does he make his beard look that good I look like prepubescent when I grow mine out he looked at the bags of coffee as the barista filled a travel mug dark roast please okay and was basically like is this even fair trade Jonathan drank his coffee very, screw this, why do I waste my money here? And also, why do girls look at that barista that way? Is it the beard? Outside, he watched the old man in the cool it man hat feed little green bones to the wiener dog missing its hind legs replaced by wagon wheels and was just like, is your wife dead, man? Do you live off microwave dinners? Did you eat your dog's legs? <laughs> this one's called The Truth About Pierre Trudeau. Pierre Trudeau founded the Montreal chapter of the Hells Angels. After he filled in on drums for the Rolling Stones, he decided to get into politics. He brought democracy to Canada after he told the Queen to get out and single-handedly fended off a band of terrorists. He invented the Wayfarer. Some guy insulted his wife on Parliament Hill, so he broke his jaw. Pierre Trudeau disappeared manning Canada's space mission to Mars. We named a volcano after him. <laughs> um, okay. Next one is called Camp Athabasca. Lost in the woods beside Camp Athabasca, Kevin stumbled around, tripping on roots and pushing away blackberry bushes and trying his damnedest to remember the survival skills they taught him on the first day. He took his knife out and carefully pulled the blade out with the tips of his fingers and started marking the trees. And as he did, he started to make more intricate symbols and this helped take his mind off what felt like a dire situation to him in the moment when really he was less than 100 yards from the campgrounds. After a while, he became okay with the possibility of being lost. Camp Athabasca was a Christian summer camp, and Kevin hadn't realized how much praying and talking about God there would be at a Christian camp. He had assumed it was Christian in name only, like his Uncle Steve. <laughs> he also didn't like his cabin leader, Schroeder. Schroeder was always pushing him to swim and play basketball, even though Kevin told him he was no good at these things. He continually corrected Kevin whenever he said Indian. We're on indigenous land, Kevin, not Indian. Kevin knew this, but indigenous had too many syllables and consonants for him to overcome with his lisp. So he just kept saying Indian and, and enduring Schroeder rolling his eyes and correcting him. Further into the woods, he sat down and took his water bottle out and drank it all, another thing that he would have known not to do had he remembered first day's survival class. He thought about how nice it would be to sleep or maybe just live out in the woods. As Kevin's blood sugar dropped and his eyes became heavy, he thought of a dream he had after his grandfather had died. His grandpa, instead of dying of lung cancer, was covered in scabs and had simply left to live in the mountains to hide from the world. He imagined his grandpa now, muscly but still with a beer belly, emerging from the fern with a pot of craft dinner and taking his hand and saying, time to go, kiddo. Kevin reached up to take his grandfather's hand, but it was Schroeder who pulled Kevin up. 
You're late for chapel, buddy, Schroeder said. I was trying to find Indian arrowheads, he told him. <laughs> Kevin's grandpa winked at him from the blackberries, eating a mouthful of macaroni. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, this one is called There's More Than One Way. To skin a cat, I told her. Many ways to accomplish a task. Multiple ways to murder something, I realized is what I was saying. An old metaphor apparently from a more brutal time where skinning a cat was frequent enough and necessary enough that one had to consider the multiple ways in which one could do it. So opting for a less violent way of conveying the same sentiment, I go to say to her that there's more than one way to pet a cat. But my mind, the gutter it is, the expression is not innocuous. I pause, it's rife with sexual overtones. I think of another twist on the cliche to avoid both violence and, and perversion, and I realize I've conflated the two. I think about why skinning is the expression that took hold instead of petting, and how the rule of thumb has equally violent origins, and how if we were less afraid to pet and more hesitant to skin, then maybe it would have been a rule of none instead. And so I say to her that there's more than one way to pet a cat, and I smirk and I wink because I feel no shame for suggesting that there are multiple ways in which to love something, including figurative and literal cats. And I take her hand in mine and hope that we, not specifically her and I, but hopefully us and everyone, can find solutions where cats are purring instead of dying, and our thumbs are only used to measure the distance around one another's hands. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this one's called Things You Should Know About the Armstrong Ghost Train. Number one, while its cars are nearly invisible, its lights can be seen at all hours of the day. This makes it look like a regular train at night. Two, it is not in fact the ghost of a deceased train, but a train built by ghosts of similar ethereal materials as their own bodies. Three, the urban myth debunked by popular television series Mythbusters that trains can suck you beneath them as a result of their momentum began with the Armstrong ghost train. This is because it literally sucks people beneath it. This is how the train is fueled. <laughs> Number four, maybe it was the ghost train, maybe it wasn't Brad, what was your father doing out there anyway? Number five, while many believe the ghost train to be simply hauling various and unknown varieties of ghost freight, there are in fact a number of passenger cars. These cars look the same as the freight cars because ghosts like to keep the blinds drawn whenever possible. Ghosts like to get freaky. <laughs> Six, no Brad, I've never seen a passenger car with the blinds up, that's just what people have told me. No, I won't ask them if they saw your dad. Number seven, while you might think that the ghost train would have some kind of haunting, soul-corrupting whistle, the sound is actually not audible to human ears. It's sort of like a dog whistle or those things you attach to the hood, to, hood of your car to scare away deer. If the radio station you're listening to in your car ever becomes really staticky, though, and you're driving near a railroad in the Armstrong, you can be sure the ghost train is near. Number eight, members of the Armstrong ghost train subreddit R, Armstrong Ghost Train, are convinced the train's conductor is Armstrong's first mayor, James M. Wright. They have no evidence to back this up, however, and their fervor for this claim is no doubt some form of post-colonial melancholia. Number nine, just because you can't blame the ghost train for your dad leaving doesn't mean it doesn't exist, Brad. <laughs> Number 10, ghost tours in Armstrong, in the Armstrong area and the rest of the Okanagan Valley don't talk about the Armstrong ghost train. While some see this as a sign that the ghost train isn't legit, it's actually because ghost enthusiasts in the area, particularly the ones running tours, are snobs and like to keep the good ghosts to themselves. Number 11, yes, Brad, your dad was a snob. Number 12, an oddly common question about the ghost train is whether or not it has a cow catcher. Of course it does. Number 13, while the ghost train 
devours nearby humans as its fuel, it passes through cars or cars pass through it without incident. Number 14, that was wind, Brad, not the ghost train. Your dad was lying. And finally, number 15, don't go talking about the ghost train willy-nilly to just anybody. Most people will just brush you off. Most ghost train enthusiasts will, wear, will be wearing a subtle enamel pin. These folks will be more than willing to chat with you over a coffee or, a, or beer about all things Armstrong Ghost Train. Except for Brad, don't talk to him. He'll just tear up and ask dumb questions about his dad. <laughs> this next one's called Tim Himself. The Eucharist, also called Horton Communion, Stanley Supper, and other names, is a rite considered by most Canadians to be a sacrament. It is a ceremony in which donuts are eaten and coffee is drunk as a way of showing devotion to Tim Horton. According to the Hockey News, it was instituted by Tim Horton during his Stanley Supper, giving his teammates donuts and coffee during the All-Star break. Tim commanded his fans and friends alike to do this in memory of me while referring to the donut as my body and the coffee as my blood. Communion is an intimate encounter with Horton in which we sacramentally receive Horton into our bodies that we may be more completely assimilated into his. The Eucharist also strengthens the individual because in it, Tim himself forgives us major and minor penalties and gives us the strength to resist the penalty box. It is also the very channel of eternal life, Tim himself. Communion may be received either in the hand or on the tongue. After you have received communion, it is appropriate to roll up the rim and thank Tim for coming to you in the Holy Eucharist. <laughs> After receiving Tim into one's own body and being drawn more closely into his, how could one do any less? <laughs> All right. All right, I've just got three more. Um, this one is called hashtag WCW. I wrote it about my girlfriend. Having just discovered William Carlos Williams' writing, loving most to all of it, defying older brother and PhD candidate who says WCW is kind of old news to those in the know, searching hashtag William Carlos Williams and not finding much, because of course that's kind of long for the internet, trying again with hashtag WCW, finding actually at least a million posts, mostly photos of women, thinking holy cow, girls really like William Carlos Williams, realizing after a few clicks that hashtag WCW means woman crush Wednesday and not William Carlos Williams, thinking gosh, what a waste of a good hashtag, scolding all mankind for not being better read and for contributing so enthusiastically to such a shallow activity, then putting himself in others' shoes, reassessing hashtag WCW as maybe a kind and wonderful thing for those deemed crushworthy by their peers, a real middle of the week hump day pick me up, and thus resolving to be a part of this event, he settled on being quite lovely and thinking of homage, thinking of form and content relations, relationships, thinking of double entendre perhaps, and choosing to do it for all hashtag WCW women, but also perhaps just for a single hashtag WCW worthy woman who might understand if she reads it but might not, and resigning himself to being okay with it if she doesn't, deriving enough satisfaction from the piece itself, he writes, so much depends upon my fingers circling your hip bone through the fabric of your maxi skirt. All right, just two more. Oh, okay. This one's called Under Failed Orbits. The boat run aground on the edge of Swan Lake rocked each time we reached for a beer. Our heads rested on the edge and we looked up and connected constellations with our fingers. We talked about graduating, grad schools, and the rock they gave us to symbolize forging our minds into greatness. That rock, he said, pulling it out of his pocket, skipping it, skipping it across the water. A meteor shower lit up the sky, and maybe it was the beer, but I was unfazed. That's us, he said, our rocks failing to find orbit somewhere, plummeting back to where we began. When it dissipated, he pressed his lips to mine. A thousand ducks quacked and fluttered above us. He wiped a tear from his cheek before a gust of wind flipped the boat and trapped me beneath it. I didn't see it happen, despite how the journalist pressed me. Aliens? Nah. Light leaked in from the edges of the boat as I cut my fingers trying to flip it back over. I went to grad school. He didn't. 
And people always tell me what a great decision I made for my future, passively referring to him. It felt like this, he told me years later, hugging me for hours until the tension broke and a warm calm came over me. Yeah, that's it, he said. I was a success and he, beard like a bird's nest, sometimes homeless, paddling out into the middle of Swan Lake every night, who never did anything but try to be better, was now the crazy lake guy. As though we're not all waiting for someone, something to come back to us. Okay. Thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. I've just got one quick one before I finish. Um, it's called Obey Your Master. And again, thank you. A penny saved is a penny burned. Doom unto others as you would have them doom unto you. Good things come to those who hate. To each his throne, a cross in hand is worth two in the thrash. The road to hell is paved with God inventions. Rule or rule not, there is no die. Abandon hip, cross the swine, slay. Always wear black after every day. Tip your hater, bleed and begin again. Raise hell and prosper. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Tristan, you do go on. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, welcome back uh, to the Inspired Word Cafe. We're here with Tristan Carter. How are you, Tristan? You know, I'm doing real good after wow. I survived the cold getting that's, here. <laughs> that's a great story, Tristan. Um, uh, so I just wanted to, to ask you a little, bit of, uh, a little bit about your writing, for starters. Then we got some really hard-hitting questions after that. This, so just, just, just to prepare you for that. So um, could, you, could you just tell us a little bit about how you got started writing? Oh, well, like originally I wanted to be a screenwriter. And then I realized just how hard that is to do, so I did some easier things, basically. <laughs> do you find that uh, cinema or screenwriting still uh, influences your, your fiction or your, or your writing practice? Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. I, I find I'm like a much more, um, I'm much more, I guess, like visual writer, right. and like I, I, I don't tend to, uh, I prefer I prefer writing that I guess stays outside of my characters heads and I just sort of you know right portray what they're doing rather than what they're thinking yeah no yeah. none of the like narrative over or uh yeah narrative over the top anyway yeah. that was that was intent intentional stuff so um <laughs> we're, we're just gonna move on I was wondering you you used the term uh flash fiction yeah. a couple times I was wondering maybe, maybe you could just uh talk a little bit about that for some of our viewers who who don't know yeah, for sure. Um, flash fiction is like generally considered short. Like it's any short fiction that's usually under a thousand words. Right. But it, it, you know, it sort of has a. I, I find like the most sort of um, the <clears throat> most potent examples of it are tend to be under five hundred words. Right. Um, yeah, I discovered in in Esquire magazine of of all places <laughs> they had they had a, these they used to have a seventy nine word story contest. And uh, one summer when I discovered that, I got so into it, and I just wrote a 79-word story, like, every week. And I got so into it that I forgot to enter the contest, and then they haven't had the contest since, <laughs> which is a bummer. But, but I discovered this, like, this forum that I'm, like, really, really passionate about, yeah. so it was exciting. Um, what, do you, what do you think working in a, um, you know, with, with a constraint of at least a word count or working within the constraint of flash fiction, how do you think that affects how you, uh, how you compose a piece? Well, it definitely like it definitely teaches you an economy of words, right? right? Like yeah. you 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 can't indulge yourself in in sort of florid description of, of things, right? So mm -hmm. I'm a man of few words, so I understand yeah. <laughs> that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, like I, I don't know. I think it just I think everyone should at least um, try flash fiction because right. I, I think it'll make even even um, you know big you know, meaty novels, um, you know, a little more efficient with right. your word use. Try, try flash fiction, uh, but yeah. use a spotter. Yeah. <laughs> fentanyl these, is, these days. Um, so now we're going to get into some of the more, the, the really serious stuff. So, um, so uh, my first question is, uh, uh, who would win in a fight, uh, Goku or Superman? Oh, man, what a question. Yeah, it's, it's the fight that everyone wants to see, uh, I know. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't, uh, 
there's there's way too many you know you've got you're gonna Go- disappoint a lot of people you've got you've got goku <laughs> going super saiyan you've got kamehameha's you've got all kinds of things that i may not even know about because yeah. i've really kept up with dragon ball i know my superman a bit more than, right. than my dragon ball so i mean i feel like superman maybe might win I feel like he's got, I think he's got a, a bigger toolkit of right. super abilities than Goku might. Well, that's, you're wrong. So, <laughs> um, it's a, it's just, that's okay. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, could Jesus microwave a burrito so hot that he himself could not eat it? Yes, because Jesus was a guy and most people could. Right. It's a very brief answer. It's good. Um, so, uh, where 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 can we find more of your work? Uh, I have a blog, right? A little Tumblr blog called uh, it's uh, pulphousefire.tumblr.com. Sweet. Yeah, I was listening it. to that. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm 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 gonna. I'm going to move on to a different question here. That's really I really thought through this one. Um, pretty, you know, pretty. Took me took me a while to write it. Um, so, I was I was quite, if if you were a vegetable, yeah, what vegetable would you be? Oh man, I know that's the this is the hardball question right I know. here. It's like turnip. I don't. Yeah. How can you just? There's so many vegetables. Um, you know, so. I don't know a beet maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but not because I'm beet like. Right. You just see <laughs> pea red. I and, I don't know. Oh right, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I'm not. I <laughs> like car- like I mean, physically maybe a carrot, <laughs> but my soul, but my soul is like a beet, a root vegetable. <laughs> right. Yes. Somewhere in there. That's that's good. That's <laughs> um, okay. So uh, thank you, Tristan, for for coming out tonight. Thanks for reading. That was super super rad. You're welcome. You can find uh, more of Tristan, obviously tonight's reading. More of uh, all of Inspired Word Cafe stuff at inspiredwordcafe.com. You can also check us out on Facebook. Um, there's probably some like posters on the ground somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, y'all, you stop, please, you're good. <laughs>